Welcome to Brother Miller's Notes. I'm so glad you're with me today as we study 3rd Nephi, chapters 17 through 19. I don't know if you ever had the experience like I have when you've gone and listened to like several series of speakers. For me, like General Conference. You listen to the General Conference sessions on Saturday, and you listen to them on Sunday, and Sunday afternoon, when the last session of, of conference is over, I sit back and go, Wow. And some of the speakers blend together and I can't tell you exactly which one said what. And there's some I remember and, and some, honestly, until I reread them, I don't even remember. But you're a little bit, or for me, I'm a little bit overwhelmed and it's kind of like, oh, wow. I sense that, kind of that same feeling, 3rd Nephi 17. Uh, here's some people who've had an opportunity to have Jesus Christ appear to them and to be able to come up and have an experience with him. And then Jesus teaches them and realizes, wow, you're pretty drained. You've had a day with me, and it has been a highlight day. And he perceives that they're tired. And that maybe, like, we have a taste of that, just a taste, after we've watched a general conference. Like, wow, there's a lot here. And Jesus, looking at Nephite, saying, oh, let me help you out. And he says this in chapter 17, verse 3. Therefore, go ye unto your homes. And ponder upon the things which I have said. Ask of the Father in my name, that ye may understand. And prepare your minds for the morrow, and I come unto you again. And in my scriptures I highlighted, go, ponder, ask, understand, prepare. And the promise, I come to you. That's a great pattern for us as we go, as we're doing things in life, go to our homes. Take time to ponder. Ask Heavenly Father that we can better understand things. And then it helps to prepare our, our, our minds as we ponder and process for tomorrow, for the opportunity for Christ to be with us again. President Gordon B. Hinckley said this, quote, I heard President David O. McKay say to the members of the 12 on one occasion, Brethren, we do not spend enough time meditating. I believe that with all my heart. Our lives become extremely busy. We run from one thing to another. We wear ourselves out in thoughtless pursuits of goals which are highly ephemeral or fleeting monetary. We are entitled to spend some time with ourselves in introspection, in development. I remember my dear father when he was about that age that I am now. He lived in a home where there was a rock wall on the grounds. It was a low wall, and when the weather was warm, he would go and sit on his wall. It seemed to me he sat there for hours thinking, meditating, pondering things that he would say and write, for he was a very gifted speaker and writer. He read much, even into his very old age. He never ceased growing. Life for him was a great adventure in thinking. We all do a lot of studying, but most of us don't do much meditation. We don't take time to think. I'd like to suggest that next fast day, everybody in this hall set aside an hour or two. Sit by yourselves. Go in the bedroom and lock the door. Go out in the yard under a tree. Go in your study if you have one and shut the door. And think about yourself and your worthiness. Read from this great book of Mormon. There's a great word that's used. Ponder. Ponder? What do I mean by ponder? What do we mean by ponder? Well, I think it simply means kind of quietly thinking things through. Ponder what you've read. Ponder your life. Are you worthy? Are you living the commandments? A couple other quotes on just pondering and meditation. I just want to share while we're just on that topic. Elder Worthland said, Pondering, which means to weigh mentally, to deliberate, to meditate, can achieve the opening of spiritual eyes of one understanding. I love that. Opens the uh, spiritual eyes of one's understanding. Elder Bednar said, Writing down what we learn, think, and feel as we study the scriptures is another form of pondering and a powerful invitation to the Holy Ghost for continuing instruction. I like that. It's an example of pondering. Write it down, what we think, and as we study the scriptures. President Eyring said this, Reading, studying, and pondering are not the same. We read words, and we may get ideas. We study, and we may discover patterns and connections in the scriptures. But when we ponder, we invite revelation by the Spirit. Pondering to me is the thinking and the praying I do after reading and studying in the scriptures carefully. A couple more quotes for you. This is Elder Ashton. 
Marvin J. Ashton, by pondering, we give the spirit an opportunity to impress and direct. Pondering is a powerful link between the heart and the mind. As we read the scriptures, our hearts and minds are touched. If we use the gift to ponder, we can take these eternal truths and realize how we can incorporate them into our daily actions. Pondering is a progressive mental pursuit. It's a great gift to those who have learned to use it. We find understanding, insight, and practical application if we'll use the gift of prompting. And one last one, President Spencer W. Kimball. We hope, for instance, that either before or after your series of Sunday meetings, depending on when your particular consolidated meeting schedule, you will do what the Savior asked Nephites disciples to do. After he taught them, he asked them to go to their homes and to ponder and to pray over what was said. Let us keep that pattern in mind. And I see this whole chapter 17 as one example of a part of the character of Jesus Christ. How he's able to be quick to observe and to be compassionate with those around him. In verses 7 through 10, he heals their sick. And he prays with them in verses 13 to 20. And then he brings the children together. And this is skipping to verse uh, 11. And it came to pass, he commanded their little children should be brought. So they brought their little children and set them down upon the ground around about him. And Jesus stood in the midst. And the multitude gave way till they had all been brought to him. And you have this glory experience, glorious experience where these little ones are ministered to by angels. Verse 24. And they looked to behold, they cast their eyes towards heaven. And they saw the heavens open, and they saw angels descending out of heaven as if it were in the midst of fire. And they came down and encircled those little ones about, and they were encircled about the fire, and the angels did minister unto them. I love Christ's compassion to the people who are drained, to those who are afflicted with whatever disease they had, mental or physical or emotional, to pray with them and to minister to them and to call down help, heavenly help for them. Elder Ulysses Soares said, The compassionate attitude of Jesus is rooted in charity, namely, in his pure and perfect love, which is the essence of his atoning sacrifice. Compassion is a fundamental characteristic of those who strive for sanctification. And this divine quality intertwines with other Christian traits, such as mourning those with mourn, and having empathy, mercy, and kindness. The expression of compassion for others is, in fact, the essence of a gospel of Jesus Christ, and a marked evidence of our spiritual and emotional closeness to the Savior. Furthermore, it shows the level of influence He has on our way of life and demonstrates the magnitude of our spirits. You get to chapter 18, and now Christ wants to help out in multiple ways. One is, well, we're talking about my gospel and having faith, and repenting, and entering a covenant of baptism, and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. And at this point, he introduces the sacrament to them. It's also a leadership lesson. But let's first just do the leadership lesson, then go back to the sacrament. Verse 1, it came to pass, Jesus commanded his disciples that they should bring forth some bread and wine unto him. And while they had gone for, for bread and wine, he commanded the multitude that they should sit themselves down upon the earth. And when the disciples had come with bread and wine, he took of the bread and brake and blessed it. And he gave unto the disciples commanded that they should eat. And when they had eaten they were and were filled, he commanded they should give to the multitude. So I just pause on verse 4, just as a leadership lesson. I love how the Savior talks spiritually. Okay, this is the twelve disciples, okay? I want you, I'm going to give you the 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 bread and the wine, the sacrament first. You need to eat and be filled. There's an example for us as, as leaders to have that spiritual charge in our batteries to make sure that we're not neglecting our spirituality, our relationship with God, as we are hoping to help minister to others. There's a little lesson where Christ is saying, hey, make sure that you have that spirit with you, that you're paying the price, you're taking care of yourself spiritually, that you're nourishing yourself with scripture study, with prayer, with the things that, little simple things, with your partaking in the sacrament, so you can go out and minister to others. 
And in verse 7 he says, And this shall ye do in remembrance of my body, which I have shown for you. And it shall be a testimony unto the Father that ye do always remember me. And if you do always remember me, ye shall have my spirit to be with you. This is done as he breaks the bread. Skipping down a few verses as he's blessing the wine. Verse 10, And when the disciples had done this, Jesus said unto them, Blessed are ye for this thing which ye have done, for this is fulfilling my commandments, and this doth witness unto the Father that ye are willing to do that which I have commanded you. And this shall always you shall always do to those who repent and are baptized in my name, and ye shall do it in remembrance of my blood, which I have shed for you, that ye may witness unto the Father that ye do always remember him, that if ye do always remember me, ye shall have my spirit to be with you. There is a key focus, once again, on this is my atonement. This is why I am giving the sacrament. So it's a part of a covenant to remember. To remember me, to remember the covenant you've you've uh, made with me, to bring you closer to me. President Dallin H. Oaks has emphasized to remember means to keep in memory. In the scriptures, it often means to keep a person in memory, together with associated emotions like love, loyalty, or gratitude. The stronger the emotion, the more vivid and influential the memory. We've had in, uh, at least in, in my ward and stake and area and emphasis on having a, a, a more meaningful revelatory experience during sacrament meeting. And there's been quite a bit of emphasis to make sure that for us that, that we're doing what we should be doing to make that experience for us, more meaningful, more spiritual, and for those around us. Elder Peter uh, F. Muir has said this, I invite all of us to consider five ways to increase the impact and power of our regular participation in the sacred ordinance of the sacrament, an ordinance that can help us become holy. And then here's five he, he listed. Prepare in advance. Arrive early. Sing and learn from the words of the sacrament hymn. Spiritually participate in sacrament prayers. Ponder and remember him as the sacrament emblems are passed. I testify of the multitude of blessings available to us as we increase our preparation for and spiritual participation in the ordinances of the sacrament. And there's always an invitation that for for us, whether we are, you know, members who go sacrament meeting or, or sometimes maybe multiple sacrament meetings on a day, or if we haven't been to sacrament in a while there's the invitation each week to come back every week and i hope that we all feel like okay next week we want to feel like we're invited to come back president oaks years ago said to those brothers and sisters who may have allowed themselves to become lax in this vital renewal of the covenants of the sacrament i plead in words of the first presidency that you come back and feast at the table of the lord and taste again the sweet and satisfying fruits of fellowship with the saints. Let us qualify ourselves to be our Savior's promise that by partaking the sacrament we will be filled, which means that we will be filled with the Spirit. That Spirit, the Holy Ghost, is our comforter, our direction finder, our communicator, our interpreter, our witness, and our purifier, our infallible guide and sanctifier for our mortal journey towards eternal life. This statement, I think, was so true when he gave it in 1996. And now, you know, over, well, about 30 years later, I think it's just as true or even more important. You know, there, there are some that need, need to come back and maybe from years of an experience with a pandemic, just haven't migrated back. And that invitation to all come back and be together, I think, is a wonderful and timely invitation. Christ then used some imagery that he used several times. He used it with Peter when he was uh, in Jerusalem area. Verse Chapter 18, verse 18. Behold, verily, verily, I say unto you, ye must watch and pray always, lest ye enter into temptation. For Satan desireth to have you, that he may sift you in as wheat. That sifting process. You can see the picture of uh, some women that I have, as, as they're starting to look to, get the wheat kernels off. It's really kind of a cool process. And that, that sifting to get the shaft, the little outer layer around the kernel of wheat to kind of get it off 
and just have just the wheat there. In Greek, when we study the New Testament, that word to sift means to shake in a sieve or, you know, sifting process. It also is a figuratively saying by inward agitation to try one's faith on the verge of overflow. I love that, that additional definition. Uh, sifting by, by inward agitation to try one's faith to the verge of overthrow. Hey, Satan wants to agitate you internally on the verge that you're overthrown from the faith. And so to help you so you're not overthrown from the faith because he desires to agitate you internally, pray. There is an emphasis for Christ to prayer. First, to help you, you, and your family. In verses 19, Therefore, ye must always pray unto the Father in my name. And whatsoever ye ask the Father in my name, which is right, believing ye shall receive, behold, it shall be given to, unto you. Pray in your families unto the Father, always in my name, that your wives and your children may be blessed, or you can say your husbands and your parents will be blessed, or that your friends will be blessed. I love what Elder Maxwell said a few years ago. Learning to pray is therefore the work of a lifetime. If we keep on praying, we will keep on discovering. And he also said, quote, By praying, we begin to experience what it's like when we see the interplay of man's moral agency and God's directing hand. These are things to be learned only by experience. We learn how important our intentions are, since we are instructed to pray for that which is right. Our prayers will be better if they are in fact inspired prayers. Thus, worshiping, serving, studying, praying, each in its own way squeezes selfishness out of us. It pushes aside our preoccupations with the things of the world. Another thing the Savior encourages us to do, so that maybe we're not going to have that internal agitation, is simply that we meet together oft. In verse 18, the full, the full verse is, And behold, ye shall meet together oft, and ye shall not forget, forbid any man from coming unto you when ye shall meet together, but suffer them that they may come unto you and forbid them not. President Nelson uh, recently wrote an article for the Liahona, and he talked about some of the blessings of just meeting together. I know this is probably, this is a context in the talk about 4th Nephi, but it fits really well together right here. He said, We learn from the people of 4th Nephi continued in fasting and prayer, and in meeting together off both to pray and to hear the word of the Lord. We need to meet together. Our weekly worship meetings are an important opportunity for us to find strength both individually and collectively. We partake of the sacrament, learn, pray, sing together, and support one another. Other gatherings also help foster a sense of belonging, friendship, and shared purpose. There's also a note in these verses about the sacrament and being worthy or not, and, and I just wanted to add, I love this statement from Elder Groberg. It's kind of the question, what does it mean to partake of the sacrament unworthily or worthily? How do we know if we're unworthy? He gave this great guidance when he said, If we desire to improve, which is to repent, and are not under priesthood restriction, then in my opinion we are worthy. If, however, we have no desire to improve, if we have no intention of following the guidance of the Spirit, we must ask, are we worthy to partake? Or are we making a mockery of the very purpose of the sacrament, which is to act as a catalyst for personal repentance and improvement? If we remember the Savior and all that he has done and will do for us, we will improve our actions and thus come closer to him, which keeps us on the road to eternal life. The sacrament is an intensely personal experience, and we are the ones who knowingly are worthy or otherwise. The Savior gives this declaration. I know this is just going in, in order here with chapter 18, verse 19. Therefore, ye must pray always under the Father in my name. And about this point, as, as you're reading, you may have, I'm, I'm sure you have, boy, this is in there a lot. Jesus Christ specifically tells these Nephites at least 11 times to pray unto the Father in his name. And I've listed all 11 there that I found, and maybe you'll find additional. When in a few chapters, the Savior repeats something 11 times, it's got to be important. Number one, Pray to the Father. Two, pray always. Three, 
pray in my name. And it's interesting to note in verse chapter 19, verse 9, what they're praying the most for. And they did pray for that which they most desired. And they desired that the Holy Ghost should be given them. That's a wonderful reminder for us today that maybe that should be our desire today as we say our prayers is that the Spirit will be able to be with us. Elder David A. Bednar reminded us that. Do we remember to pray earnestly and consistently for that which we should most desire, even the Holy Ghost? Or do we become distracted by the cares of the world and the routine of daily living and take for granted or even neglect this most valuable of all gifts? Receiving the Holy Ghost starts with our sincere and constant desire for His companionship in our lives. There's a story that Elder Holland talks about with, with the time of Prophet Joseph Smith, about how we as uh, Latter-day Saints differ from maybe other religions. Elder Holland taught, In our own time, the Prophet Joseph Smith was asked wherein the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints differed from other religions of the day. He replied the distinction lay in the gift of the Holy Ghost and that all of their considerations were contained in that gift. In light of these experiences, ancient or modern, old world or new, perhaps all disciples of Christ, all members of his true church, should pray for the influence and guidance of the Holy Ghost as that heavenly gift which they most desire. And I love this, this quote from many years ago on the effect the Spirit has on us. Elder Parley P. Pratt wrote, The gift of the Holy Ghost quickens all the intellectual faculties, increases, enlarges, expands, and purifies all the natural passions and affections, and adapts them by the gift of wisdom to their lawful use. It inspires virtue, kindness, goodness, tenderness, gentleness, and charity. It develops beauty of person, form, and features. It tends to health, vigor, animation, and social feeling. It develops and invigorates all the faculties of the physical and intellectual man. It strengthens, invigorates, gives tone to the nerves. In short, it is, as it were, marrow to the bone, joy to the heart, light to the eyes, music to the ears, and life to the whole being. There is great emphasis on that prayer and prayer for the Holy Ghost. There's also a lot that I'm not going to really talk about today, but uh, there's a lot that Christ teaches us about prayer that we can learn from Jesus' example. One thing I love, and maybe for me is a little bit of a highlight as I reread in 3 Nephi uh, 17 19, is Christ's smile. You get that in verse 25, and it came to pass Jesus blessed them, and they did pray unto him, and his countenance did smile upon them. And the light of his countenance did shine upon them. And behold, they were as white as the countenance and also the garments of Jesus. And behold, the whiteness thereof did exceed all the whiteness. Yea, even there could be nothing on the earth so white as the whiteness thereof. And I just think, oh, in my life, I've had an experience recently where I have felt that peace that comes from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I felt that, just that smile. Um, and so I would hope that Maybe as you consider um, what, what the Savior is teaching in these chapters, now we're at the end of the video, that one thing I'd encourage you to do is just think of a time, think of, you know, what did you do today? What did you do this week? When Christ would be, yeah, smiling upon you. And I hope that just brings to a mind a memory that increases your faith and, and really your desire to follow Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for spending some time with me today. I love your thoughts and your suggestions on the, our YouTube channel. And um, also, just so you know, if any of the quotes I use, I put up at brothermiller.org. So if that may be helpful if you can cut and paste and want to put it in your scriptures. Hey, have a lovely day. Keep smiling.